Okay, so now you've learned about the properties of light in water, we can go into more detail about different types of eye structures. So we're gonna talk first about the compound eye um, and how it's structured. So you can see hundreds of facets in this dragonfly eye in front of you, and you can see different shapes of facets, bigger ones on the top, smaller ones around the front, different colors. All of that is important to how these eyes work. So each facet is called an omatidium. And a compound eye is made up of an array of these hexagonal facets that fit all together. There can be hundreds of omatidia or tens of thousands of omatidia in a single compound eye, such as this dragonfly eye. Each omatidia is covered by a clear lens, and there's often a second lens below the cornea as well. There are three different types of compound eyes, and I'll try to explain the differences among them. There are aposition eyes, optical superposition eyes, and neural superposition eyes. So in aposition eye, there is um, a single omatidium, consists of, and I'm gonna use this term a, a bit, a diopteric apparatus, which is the lens and the cone, and then um, eight retinula cells with pigments inside. The pigments are found in what are called radomeres, and they're fused into a single rhabdom. And those rhabdom, the, the, this little schematic on the side is showing you the, the lens cells along the top and the rhabdom or the, the different rhabdoms along the bottom, those kind of rectangles on the bottom. So what happens is the light, light can strike the rhabdom, but only when the light comes directly through the lens. So light that's coming off to the side won't hit the rhabdom in an A position eye. That's a little different than a neural superposition eye, um, which is a variation on the A position plan. The eight rhabdomeres aren't fused into a single rhabdom, so they can, they can detect light at, across a larger surface area. And um, another difference about neural superposition eyes is that the axons, the nerves basically, that emerge from a single omatidium are not kept together in the same cartridge. And so this allows the photo signal to be received by the optic ganglion. Um, it allows like a seven times stronger signal. So it's, these, these eyes are more sensitive, especially in low light. So if you're an organism that deals with low light conditions, you most likely have um, evolved a neural superposition type eye. The optical superposition eye is a little bit different still. Um, they're, they're shorter, the rhabdom are fused, but there's more space. There's this clear zone um, inside the omatidia and Pigments are allowed to migrate vertically in response to light intensity. They can move up and down. And so this is another way of increasing sensitivity in low light. So this is a different type of adaptation that um, other organisms have developed to see in low light conditions. And then near the base of these eyes, there's a thick mat of air-filled tracheal space called the tapetum. And the tapetum is actually what causes eye shine. So like when you're taking a picture of a cat outside at night and its eyes glow in that really weird green way, that's the tapetum reflecting light back to you. Um, and so that's what's resulting in eye shine. So some insects have, have that uh, as well. Okay, so I know this is a little bit theoretical and kind of weird and, and the details honestly aren't like terribly important. Just recognize that there are there are three main types of compound eyes and that some of them deal with low light conditions better. So if you wanna compare the three different types, you can spend some time on this slide. So how do um, insects form images? The Hollywood version of, you know, when you think of a, a bug looking at something, it looks like each little hexagonal pixel creates a full image and that's not really true at all. Okay, so that's, that's a lie, it's a myth. Um, but each of those hexagons produces a pixel, um, a pixel of light intensity and possibly color. And so an insect might look at the flower and see the, the image in the middle that's very pixelated um, versus our human eyes, we can see more resolution, more detail. But 
the insects don't see the Hollywood version um, with multiple images. So the problem with image formation for aquatic insects is that water um, has a refractive in index similar to that of the, the lens material. And so you can't focus in water um, easily. So to get around that, a lot of aquatic insects have flat corneal lenses instead of curved lenses to compensate. So that's one way. And they've um, created, well, they haven't created it, but there is space um, for refraction inside the dioptic apparatus, right? The, the lens to the cone inside that space, refraction can happen inside there. And so to create an image, each omatidium will see a pixel and then in combination across all the omatidia, the insects will see an image. And you can see that image is created through many pixels. So pixels, and now that we deal with pixels a lot because of our technology, our digital film technology, um, this makes a lot more sense, I think, to students right off the bat. That resolution is the number of pixels, and the more the more pixels you have, the higher the resolution. So the more omatidia an organism has, the higher the resolution they're going to have um, around image formation. So the um, resolution is the number of pixels, in this case, the number of omatidia. Here you can see one of these really weird male mayflies again, and the different types of compound eyes um, and ocelli that this organism has. Lots, lot of stuff going on for trying to create images and detect light in this little guy. Um, the larger the diameter of the lens, so the, the larger the hexagonal size of each of these omatidia, the higher the resolution, and the increased curvature. So um, these guys are kind of interesting because they have these eyes that pop off off the top and there's not a lot of curvature versus the dragonfly eyes that have a ton of curvature. Increasing curvature can increase resolution as well. And for some organisms that grow through different instar stages, their resolution increases with each instar. They develop more and more omatidia through time. There can also be resolution across the eye, um, variation in resolution across the eye. So different parts of the eye might have different levels of resolution. And the highest resolution is often found in the fovea or the acute zone of the eye. And this can vary depending on the organism and what it's, what habitat or environment it's used to uh, moving around in. Light uh, sensitivity and color. So um, many eyes have various adaptations. Um, some eyes can regulate the amount of light coming in. Some eyes can change the sensitivity of light receptors and they can move the rhabdom up or down. And so all of those things can increase light sensitivity. Color detection relies on having different pigments in your eyes. And so some insects have um, up to five different pigments um, and the, cor the corneal lenses can also be colored and have color filters that can help an insect to detect color um, and change the color of the light coming in. So this is um, really interesting and it's why some insect eyes are really vividly colored, like the eyes of these um, horse flies. So they're in the family Tabanidae. They have aquatic um, larvae. Uh, these are in their diptera, right? Fly larvae. Um, and these are horse flies. Um, funny story is they are very common in January, which is the peak of summer in South America and um, parts of Chile and Argentina. And they're super annoying because they bite. <laughs> you can ask my daughter, she hates them. They're called tabanos and they swarm you in the summer. So watch out if you go to South America in the summertime for the tabanos. Um, okay, the other thing is that um, light can be polarized and insects might be sensitive to the polarization. So when light strikes a smooth surface, it can become polarized. And so this happens a lot when it strikes the surface of water. What basically happens is you have light moving in all these directions and it hits a smooth surface and it kind of orients everything in one direction. Um, and you can buy uh, polarized glasses to help you take the glare off of um, the surface of the water when that light is coming towards your eyes. Polarized glasses have lots of little lines that block out parts of the light that are coming at you. Um, and insects can take advantage of um, polarized light, especially those insects that are sensitive in the UV range. Um, and they can use patterns of polarization for navigation. And they can also use polarized light to find water bodies because light becomes polarized when it strikes that smooth surface. 
Um, interestingly, you know, polarized sunglasses have all these kind of microscopic slits that um, reduce the glare, but that's the same, um, the same mechanism that was used by um, humans many, many years ago, hundreds, thousands of years ago, um, and to this day in regions where light is striking ice and snow and has the same polarization effect. And so to, to cut down on the amount of light um, and to make it easier to see that, you know, you would have eyeglasses with a tiny slit. Some insects have different types of eyes. So um, this is a gyrenid beetle and it has both surface eyes and submerged eyes. It can see both above and below at the same time. And then I'll just talk real briefly about ocelli. Typically there are three ocelli on the dorsal surface of the head. Here you can see those big compound eyes, but if you look closely between the two little antennae, there are three little um, kind of, uh, yeah, three little bumps. Those are the ocelli. And what's interesting is the ocelli point in three different directions. Um, each one has a single large lens. The ocelli cannot form images. Um, but they do help with light dark perception and they can assist with orientation during flight. Often for um, organisms like flying dragonflies, the each ocelli is looking um, off at the horizon and helps keep the organism flying flat. And so it helps with um, uh, those tipping, the, you know, the three directions that you can tip as a flying organism. It helps to keep the organism steady on the horizon. Stomata, um, just real briefly, the holometabolous insects only have stomata. They don't have compound eyes and they don't have a cell. So here's a coleoptera, a beetle larva, showing about six to seven different stomata. These are always lateral on the side of the face um, or the head. They're light sensing organs. They can also form images. There tend to be one to seven stomata on each side, and they're similar in structure to a single omatidia, each one. They each have um, either one or many rhabdoms, and they're often considered simple eyes, but they actually allow holometabolous insects to orient themselves, perceive simple patterns, detect movement, detect polarization, and discriminate color. So they can form images, um, and they can detect patterns and they're really great at detecting movement. So they're not that simple. They're just about as simple as a compound eye. They're just not as many um, of these light sensing organs in a holometabolous insect. And then finally, some insects can generate light through bioluminescence. So the typical pathway is the oxidation of luciferin by the enzyme luciferase. And this is tends, tends to be rare in aquatic insects, partly because it doesn't make a lot of sense to make light underwater. It doesn't travel very far, and so it's not a great way to signal to each other. But um, beetles in the family Lampyridae, the Luciola beetles, some of these have aquatic larval stages that do generate light. And that as the adults, we're um, familiar with them as fireflies. They're not flies, they're beetles and they use their light, um, their bioluminescence to attract mates, to attract potential prey. Some organisms might use it as a warning to predators as well. So that's it for photoreception. Uh, see you next time.